Mac Voices is supported by Text Expander by Smile. Find out just how powerful a few keystrokes can be at TextExpander.com. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, fall is rapidly approaching, if it's not upon us already, depending on how you calculate fall, uh, whether you do it by the calendar or whether the chill in the air. And that means that we're going to be seeing a lot of news and updates from Apple. Some we expect, some that will probably be surprises. One thing, though, that we are pretty sure is going to happen and pretty quickly is Mac OS Catalina, the new version. And so this one has a, a few twists to it, and that's why I wanted to make sure we got to talk to Joe Kissel about his new Take Control of Upgrading to Catalina from Take Control Books uh, before we get any farther into it. Joe, welcome. It's good to see you. Hello. Nice to be back. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's good. It's, it seems like I haven't talked to you for a while. It's been a busy summer, I guess, for both it, of us. Summer has been weird and uh, long and interesting. Uh, I have a feeling you might be seeing more of me <laughs> the next exactly. few months. Okay. I just have a feeling about that. Hey, we'll take it. We'll, we'll take you every time you can get here. No question. Because awesome. you usually bring with you gifts in the form of new books or updated books to help us do more and avoid problems. So, yes, anytime, Joe. Awesome. Yes, I well, I have such a gift today. It's it's a gift that anyone can have for as little as twelve dollars and ninety nine cents. Wait a minute, that's not anyway. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> well, yeah. And and this one, I think uh, we, we really need to pay a lot of attention to because Catalina represents quite a, a significant potential change for just about every Mac user out there. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I'm having this sense of deja vu. All right. I, I just have to say, I, I went to the dentist yesterday, okay? And I had a story that I won't bother telling. You. Anyway, I had the exact same dental procedure done that I had done had about two months previously. And I'm sitting there in the chair about to have exactly the same procedure on exactly the same tooth done due to reasons. And I say to the dentist, wow, I'm really having a sensation of deja vu. He laughed. You're not obligated to laugh. Look, I uh, look. I'm a dad. I do dad jokes. That's my thing. Anyway, um, I feel like we've been here before. Approximately checks notes. Twelve other times. <laughs> <laughs> this is my thirteenth. Take control of upgrading to Mac OS book. Thirteen times. All right. So you know, I've I've done this a lot. I I'm I, you know I've been through this. Many, many, many times. And as we've also discussed for years and years, every single year, it's like, you know, probably not that much has changed. Is is it even worth my time to bother going through these test installs and finding out what's different and writing yet another version of this book? And then I start doing the test installs and like, oh, crap, I really do need, <laughs> I really need to do another book because dang it, stuff has changed again, and like some really serious things. And as you, you know, alluded to, there are some particularly important things this time around. Well, you're right. We've had some of the upgrading books that you, if unless you were really paranoid, you could maybe skate over a little bit. This one, though, not, it doesn't concern me, but it just, everybody's going to have to pay attention. And I guess I'm more aware, simply because Apple keeps throwing up um, uh, warnings to me at in, in Mojave that, hey, this application may not be ready. This application may not run. This application needs to be updated. Yeah, I know. And and so... you got to take those seriously, man. Yeah, this this time, it's not a case of, well, maybe I can hack around it and, and, and figure out a way to make it run. No, it's not going to happen this nope. time. Nope. Yeah. So, yes, you know, you have been warned for a year, but uh, th this is this is when the stuff gets real. So uh, I, I actually put a new topic early in the book called Understand Catalina's Downsides. Because, because you know, I always install the new thing. Always. Um, I mean, I, I have to because I'm writing the books about it. But um, this time around, um, I 
there were a few reasons why I'm kind of going, ooh, mm, do I mm, do I really want to upgrade, or do I really want to upgrade right now, or oh, this is going to be exceptionally painful. As I've been looking around on articles, people have been writing about this on the web and on Twitter and everything. I'm not the only one saying that. A lot of people are going. Ugh. And so I, I wanted to start out the, the book and, and this, this talk by saying I, I would never want to discourage anyone from upgrading to the latest thing. But this time, for crying out loud, you, you got to do this with both eyes open. You have to prepare. If you don't prepare, you're going to be unhappy. And I'm expecting on whatever date Catalina is finally shipped. I mean, it's been in beta for, for months. A lot of people are installing the public beta. But once it hits for real, I am expecting like weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth on the internet where people are like, oh, but I didn't realize. So look, we're telling you this is a big deal. So I'm going to mention a few of these things. I would guess the thing that you are most on the top of your mind, you know, is the 32-bit apps. So 32-bit apps have been able to run in your Mac for a long, long time, and they look exactly like 64-bit apps. You can't tell just by opening something or clicking on its icon or whatever what kind of an app it is, but the guts are different. And unless you're a developer, you don't need to know or care about the details. You just need to know that turning a 32-bit app that will not work on Catalina into a 64-bit app that will can be a lot of work. It's not just like check a box and recompile. No, no, no. This could be hours, days, weeks of work, depending on what kind of app we're talking about. And so uh, a lot of apps aren't, aren't ready yet. Some never will be. And uh, what we don't want to have happen is that you upgrade to Catalina and you're like, this is great. I love the new background and the, the auto, you know, light changey thing and like the new features and psych. I love these new features. And then you try to launch that app that you really, really depend on. And you're just like, Oh, sorry, won't run. And, and that's the end of the story for you. We, we don't want that to happen. We, we want to make sure that you have a successful time. So, um, so I talk about how, how you find these apps and what to do about them. Okay. I, I, I want to let you go and I want to let you run at where you want to go, but then I do want to reserve a little time because I have a couple questions about a particular upgrade strategy okay. that I want to pose to you. So okay. if, if, but, but how about if we do it this way, if you had your choice, how would you go about upgrading? <sighs> All right. Uh, you know, I always say, um, upgrade all your apps before you install the new version of Mac OS. So you want to like back up your Mac really, really well, maybe a couple different ways, upgrade all your software, back it up again, cause you can never have too many backups. And then once, once you've done all that, the, the easiest way to go is just, you know, just run the installer, click, 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 let it do its thing, do an in-place upgrade because that's the easiest and fastest way. And most of the time it will, it will go through just fine. It's going to ask you a bunch of questions, a bunch of dialogues are going to come up. You, 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 you deal with those and then you're good. Now there, there are other ways to do it. Um, one of the other ways that I talk about is to um, first make a, a backup again, cause you always start with a backup and then you, you boot from your backup, erase your disc, do a clean install of Catalina onto the new disk. Then at the end, when it says you want to transfer stuff from another Mac or backup, whatever, you say, yes, of course I do. And, and you, you transfer the stuff from the backup that you just made. Now, there are other ways of doing it too. Those are the two major ways. And um, over the years, my testing has shown that the, the two almost always give you almost exactly the same end result, while the first way is a lot faster. So what I tell people is, you're gonna make your, your duplicate. Try plan A. If it doesn't work, or if you have problems, you still got your backups. You can still erase the drive, install from scratch, migrate all over your stuff all over, and, and go to plan B. But there's, there's no need to spend the extra time starting with that approach 
if there's a pretty good chance that plan A will work. So that's kind of the quick, quick summary. Okay. Gee, that um, was easy. But, but, but let me, let me come back to that. Cause I want to just say a few more words about the app incompatibilities. Um, there is an app that you can download for free called go 64 that will give you a list. You want to run this now, run this on Mojave, and it'll give you a list of all of your apps that are not 64 bit apps and therefore will not work under Catalina. And then you can decide what to do about each of them. Now, if you don't care about the apps, great, just delete them. Um, if the developer has a free update, great, you just install the free update. Now, if the update costs $500, then you might have to say, hmm. Or if there is no update, there never will be, you have to, you have to decide, well, do I stay on Mojave? Do I find a different app that does a similar thing and replace it with that? Do I upgrade to Catalina, but then I run Mojave in a virtual machine like Parallels Desktop or VMR Fusion? Or do I upgrade to Catalina, but I have a second partition on my hard drive, a second, second you know, APFS volume, and I run um, Mojave in that so I can switch back and forth to get at my old apps. Like there are a bunch of different strategies you could use and which one or ones you use will depend on your situation. But the key thing is knowledge. You, you have to know what you're getting yourself into. Like for me right now, as of today, I have 32-bit apps on the Mac that I use to produce take control books. And if I were to upgrade that Mac to Catalina today, I wouldn't be able to make books anymore. That's a pretty big problem for me. So um, of course I do have other ways to run these apps, um, but what is my complete long-term strategy going to be for all of them? I don't exactly know yet. I, I, I just know that I will keep I will keep one Mac running Mojave for at least a little while until I'm sure that I've solved all these problems. Well, doesn't the long-term strategy depend on either A, the developers upgrading the apps, or B, you finding alternatives to those mission-critical apps? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I could imagine a situation in which three or four years from now, I still have Mojave running in a, let's say, Parallels virtual machine, and I still boot that up a couple times a month to do one specific thing. Um, I, I don't want to, like, I can't, it's a little awkward, you know? It's not, like, something I would want to use all the time, but if if it's just, like, an occasional thing and there's, and, it, and, I'm, and if I'm unable to find another solution, I could I could conceive of that. It's not what I prefer, though. I, I prefer to find some some path forward that is sustainable. That is, you know, that that will be forward compatible. So, when when you do the conversion, when you first boot up and 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 uh, Catalina looks at your disk, I, I, as I recall in Mojave and probably before that. Um, it would say these apps are incompatible and it would shuffle them off to a particular place to make you aware of it and let you delete them easily. I don't think I'm making that up. You're um, not making that up. Does it happen this time? It doesn't happen with 32-bit apps. So um, the, the purpose of that was to, to find things like incompatible uh, kernel extensions and low level stuff. By the way, that's another whole thing because you can't use third party kernel extensions anymore in Catalina. And there are a bunch of like uh, peripherals, uh, input devices, display devices, certain kinds of apps that rely on these third party, they're called KECTs or kernel extensions, and they live in, you know, slash uh, system slash library slash extensions. And there are a bunch of things still there in Catalina, but they're all from Apple, so you, other other people can't put stuff in there anymore. So anyway, um, that's like a whole nother uh, category of stuff that that won't work anymore on Catalina, and you you have to hope that there are upgrades available that that use different mechanisms. Anyway, my point is to answer your question. Yeah, the installer will move some things aside, things like that 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 would just fundamentally um, interfere with starting up 
Catalina or, 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 or would, would cause it to crash. But it doesn't do that with 32-bit apps. What it's going to do with 32-bit apps is just leave them there, but the icon is going to be like a circle with a slash through it. So it's still there. It's not uninstalled. It's not moved aside. But it's clear that it, it won't work. And if you try double-clicking on it, it, you just get an error. Okay. So this time it's not going to be automatic other than the tagging of it. And then you're going to have to manually delete it. And if we're in that environment, is uh, do you have any ideas or recommendations for apps that will work in the new environment that could clean out not only the app itself, but all the cruft that goes with it? Uh, well, I, I really like Clean My Mac 10 or X. I don't know what how they pronounce it, but anyway, the latest version of Clean My Mac. Uh, it's not the only uninstaller, but it, I, I like it. I've been using it for a bunch of years, and that's it. It does it does all that. It goes through and does a deep deep clean of not just the app itself, but all the stuff in you know your library and application support files and preferences and all the little doohickeys that are scattered hither and yon. Um, it goes through and uh, deletes all that stuff. So that all traces of the app are really gone. Uh, so that's what that's what I've been using. Um, but there are there are a bunch of other tools that do similar things. So, Joe, would you would you go through that process before? And I realize you know we're talking first of all, as you say, have a backup. Yeah. And then, do you think it's wise to delete the apps, the thirty two bit apps, off your machine before you do the conversion slash migration, or do you think you can just go for it and then clean up the mess later? Uh, my personal preference would be to delete them beforehand because that gives me a, a, a cleaner system. Now, uh, we don't really have time, time to get into the technical stuff, but like, you know, on Catalina, it, in the finder, it's going to look like you just have one disc, but really behind the scenes, there are two. There's one that just has Catalina itself on it, and then there's another disc that has everything that's not part of the operating system. And the one that it's hidden, but the one that has just Catalina itself um, is not writable. It's read-only. So you literally can't put stuff in there manually. There's no like tricks with, you know, using the terminal or sudo or any kind of stuff. You, you, you can't get into there. It's, it's totally read-only. So um, anything that would otherwise have been in there has to get pushed to another location, which means it has to be designed differently. Um, so if I didn't take any action and there were any of those pieces, they would get moved or disabled anyway. Um, the one reason I might be tempted to keep a 32-bit app around is if I was if I thought later on I might set up a virtual machine or later on I might be I might have like a dual boot thing where I have one volume that's Mojave and another another volume that's Catalina maybe I want those two volumes to share the same apps uh, or maybe I want to be able to copy a 32-bit app into this virtual machine or something so if if I mean there there could be reasons to keep it around because you'll be using it in an environment that isn't Catalina. My personal preference, though, is not to. My, my personal preference is to have a clean separation. Okay. I, I, that's kind of the way I would, I would think. Um, but you, you never know. You never know. Smile and Text Expander are supporting this edition of Mac Voices. When you get a new Mac, what are the first apps you install? Which ones do you feel are the most important, the most used? The ones that make your Mac feel like your Mac and not someone else's that you've borrowed. Text Expander by Smile is at the top of my list. Why? Because saving time is important to me. Because being accurate is important to me. Because I prefer to have my Mac work for me. And Text Expander does all of those things. With Text Expander, a few characters or a short phrase expand into text and code that I use frequently. Something simple, like my full name, my address, my phone number, today's date, a few characters for each of those, and they appear, fully typed out, exactly the way I wanted them. Or something complex, like the code necessary for certain parts of publishing Mac Voices. Or an introductory email to a new team member at work, outlining the resources available to them. Or a request for an interview. The list goes on and on. The biggest challenge is recognizing that you type certain things over and over, and Text Expander can help you with that by watching what you type and suggesting new snippets to help you be more efficient. For those of you with multiple Macs, 
you can sync your snippets across so that everything is available on every machine. And for those of you with iOS devices, there's a version of Text Expander for iPhone and iPad that takes advantage of all those snippets you've already created. Text Expander requires so little and gives back so much. Find out just how much by visiting TextExpander.com and download a free trial. You'll be text expanding in no time at all. That's Text Expander from Smile at TextExpander.com. Thanks to Smile for being the longest running sponsor of Mac Voices. So, we go through this process. Are there any gotchas after, uh, other than the fact that some of your apps may not work? Um, Why, yes, there are. <laughs> thank, there thank you for that beautiful uh, segue. You know, um, okay, so for, for years now, there has been a trend of Apple throwing up dialogue saying, hey, is this okay? Uh do you approve this? Are you sure you're okay with that? Do you agree to this? Like there have been a lot more of those as as the years and operating systems have gone by. Um, you mentioned a class of them. You know, Apple's been warning us about these 32-bit apps for the last year. Well, it should come as no surprise to anyone that there are even more of these in my, in uh, in Catalina. Quite a few more. So many more that. Um, <laughs> Well-known Mac pundits whose names you would recognize are kind of going, I'm not sure I'm ready to sign up for this. There are, there are so many more. So all kinds of other activities that Apple previously deemed innocuous enough to not have to alert you about. Now, whenever it happens, you gotta, you got to either just click a thing that says, yeah, this is okay, or in, in some cases, you have to like get, go into system preferences and go to the security privacy pane and, and go here, there, and there and add a thing and click OK. So depending on the kind of alert, you may have more work to do or less work to do. But the thing is, a lot more situations prompt this to happen. For example, if, uh, if any app tries to take a screenshot or a movie of what's on your screen, Apple's like, well, this, this is something that malware could do, so we want to make sure you know and that you approve. Well. Yeah, it's true. Malware can do that, but there are lots of legitimate apps that do that too. And so, um, and and even like if if an app just wants to like store a file in a fairly boring location like your desktop, you might get an alert, you know, because Apple isn't just locking down certain parts of the system, but it's locking down most of the system now, making it very hard for, the intention is to make it hard for malware to do things without you knowing about it. That, that's great. And thank you for that. Except now I spend, you know, very much of my day clicking, okay, 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 okay. And because I have now become habituated to clicking whatever button means get out of my way and let me do my work, maybe I'm not reading these alerts very carefully and I've just gotten into the habit of click the thing that makes it go away instead of actually saying, now, wait a minute, what app is this? And am I really okay with it doing this particular thing in this particular case? Wait a minute, maybe. I'm not. Wait a minute. Maybe I'm actually really worried about this, that this app could be doing something wrong or bad. I can click deny, but then what? What, what, what am I supposed to do after that? Am I supposed to install anti-malware software? Am I supposed to uninstall the possibly but not necessarily suspicious app? Am I supposed to call Apple? Am I supposed to go into the Apple store and talk to a genius? Like, what, what does this mean? And so what Apple's doing is adding all this anxiety and paranoia, but not giving, not giving you the tools to deal with it. And so I think the result is going to be not an increase of security. People are just going to be irritated, but they're still going to click through the alerts and they're, they're either going to let the bad things happen without realizing that they're bad, or they're not going to know how to handle them if they really are. So, um, so I think that's not so good. And and I, I spend a good bit of time in the book talking about these. Does the book give you guides as to what some of these are going to be and what, to your point, what happens if I say no, then what functions do I lose or what features do I lose? I, I give such advice as I can, but 
um, what I say is, you know, in my in my many years of of doing this and installing tons and tons of software in my Mac and having a bajillion of these uh, security alerts come up, something like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, the the alert has been telling me about something that is expected and proper, like. It might have been might have been something I didn't realize was happening, but it's something that's okay. It's not like a bad app doing a bad thing. It's just okay. Yeah, fine. You can read that file there, or okay. Yeah, you can use my camera or whatever. Um, the the number of times that I have ever encountered an actual malicious app trying to do something I didn't want it to do is minuscule and it hasn't been in a really long time. Now I, I get other people have, it's not that this never happens. It does happen. It just hasn't happened to me in a really long time and it's super rare. So um, because I can't tell you what that hypothetical bad app is going to be or what it's going to be trying to do, I can't really give you good advice other than other than saying all I can really say is read the damn things. Like when an alert comes up, don't just click okay. I know it's irritating, but do try to understand what is happening and if if you're suspicious, like wait, you know. Later on you'll try to do the same thing again and another alert will come up and you, you get to decide again. But like um, if you if you realize, hey, I'm not able to save files, I must have clicked an alert that I shouldn't have clicked. Then you can you can undo that. But um, but I don't have any any magic formula that will enable you to say, oh, this is this is definitely bad, and therefore I should take steps one, two, and three. And I honestly think Apple is likely to get a lot of um, a lot of pushback on this. They're likely to get a lot of grumpy geniuses in Apple stores. Um, answering the same dumb questions over and over again, I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of throttle these alerts back or or do something to make them more useful and more actionable in the future. That's what I'm really hoping for is tell me about the things that I honestly, like seriously need to worry about. And if if I do need to worry about it, tell me what to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a no win situation and we don't want to get off into a deep philosophical discussion, but if, if Apple puts all these, uh, security procedures in place and, and makes them burdensome, you know, yeah, they draw criticism and probably rightly so. If they don't, then they draw criticism for having a less secure system. And with Apple making its bones on privacy and security, I guess this is, you know, it's the lesser of two evils, at least in their eye. Uh, yeah, like, it, and I I understand both sides of it. There, there. One of the uh, you know, I'm a Mac commercials from years ago. Uh, this was when Windows Vista first came out, and and uh, and you know, the Mac was making fun of the PC for every time it tries to do anything, saying cancel or allow, cancel or allow, cancel or allow, and and we all kind of thought that was you know, that was a really irritating thing about Windows Vista that, hey, we we smart Mac users don't need to worry about. But now we're in exactly that situation. And and you're exactly right that Apple is, you know, trying to cover their asses to a certain point to say, well, we did warn you, <laughs> you know, you can't say we didn't warn you, which is true. But like a warning is better than nothing. A solution is better than a warning. Yeah. But, so, you know, to your point, how, how do you decide or how do you make all those, uh, those warning dialogues applicable when you have, you know, how many thousands of independent developers developing all kinds of, of utilities and different things? And, you know, it's, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It's, it is tough. And, you know, there, there are, there, there's other stuff, you know, there's other categories of apps that are either not going to work or going to produce annoying alerts. And I talk about some of these in the book. Um, and, and I also want to say just, just on the topic of why you might want to be, you know, slightly more circumspect about Catalina, the, uh, the betas ha haven't been outstandingly solid, you know, <laughs> I mean, um, betas are betas. They're supposed to have bugs. They're expected to have bugs. They aren't complete yet. We get that. Um, there have been, uh, more and worse bugs. This is a subjective 
and now this is not like I counted up the number or whatever, but but my subjective impression and other people's too is that there have been more and worse bugs in the Catalina betas as well as in the iOS betas than there have been in previous years. And um, we even you know, saw where some features that were going to be in iOS 13 have now been pushed to iOS 13.1. Um, and I would not be terribly surprised if something comparable happened to Catalina, um, but it's just not really inspiring confidence. I would, I would like to, at this late date, I would like to see the betas be more solid and um, less worrying. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I'd rather I'd rather have us wait a couple extra weeks or even months to have it as rock solid as possible than just to say, okay, we hit a target date. Because we've all been there. We know what you know what happens when you hit target when you have to hit target dates is compromises get made. And that's really right. Well I, I've been having this discussion with some of my uh, other other authors in the take control world, like well, so we've seen all these bugs, and we know when Apple normally you know announces new stuff, like when the new iPhones typically come out, when you know the new Mac OS typically comes out; those dates are, are rapidly approaching, and we see the state of the software. So, what does that mean? And we're we're all wondering, you know, does this mean that there's going to be a delay in the releases? And um, the the signs that I'm seeing now suggest that Apple would rather pull features than delay releases. Um, and I don't know, I don't quite understand why they are so desperately tied to this release schedule, but I'm sure there's a reason. So um, uh, kind of you got to kind of either expect um, less solid early versions or for features to be postponed. Yeah. So let me put a let me put a, uh, a hypothetical to you. All right. Um, and th- because this involves um, a way that I've thought about. I have not. I've never tried this. Um, so I, if I have two Macs side mm-hmm. by side, mm-hmm. okay. And but but let's just say a MacBook Pro on on the left and a MacBook Air on the right. Okay. And I configure my MacBook Air as a a new machine with Catalina and I'm doing clean installs of everything over there. And with the intention, eventually, once I get, you know, it's stable and get all my apps installed with cloning that, that machine and then cloning and taking that clone and putting it on my MacBook pro. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, or that could be an iMac or, you know, whatever. It, it, and, and in the past, I know you, you can do that relatively easily, but in today's world, is there a difference in the OS installation for, say, an Air versus an iMac or versus a MacBook Pro? Uh, no. I mean, it, as, as long as both of the machines are capable of running the latest Mac OS, um, that ought to work. Um, now, you know, sometimes there's weirdness, like, like let's, let's imagine that Apple released a new Mac in September, which for all I know is possible. Um, that Mac would certainly require whatever version of, of Catalina is current when it comes out. So let's just say it's like 15.0.1. Like, I don't know, I'm just making this up. So if, if, if the new Mac's um, the minimum operating system is 15.0.1 and you installed 15.0.0 on the other Mac, then, then that, then that wouldn't work. But uh, apart from that, Mac OS is just Mac OS. And, um, as long as both, uh, both Macs support that version of, of, of Mac OS, um, what you're, what you're saying should work. Now, what you could do is install, you know, do the clean install on the one, as you described, make sure that's working great. And then uh, you could use target disk mode, you know, connect them with whatever firewire or uh, firewire, <laughs> Thunderbolt. I, I'm living in the past, uh, thun- Thunderbolt or USB-C cable or, or whatever it is. Um, and then you can use your favorite uh, cloning utility to, to basically now wait, you know, no, you actually can't do that. Well, 
yeah. So if the, if the target, sorry, I'm just, <laughs> I, I need to like draw myself a little diagram so I'm sure I get this right. The the one the the, the computer that you are moving to, the the target will have to be the one that starts up in target disk mode. The one that you that has the Catalina already installed will have to be actually running so that you can launch a cloning utility and run it to copy that stuff onto the other drive. Um, I've never done exactly that, but I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work. I would expect that it should work. Um, what I would tend to do myself, just because you know I'm the backup guy, um, is I would tend to clone my my whichever MacBook Air uh, onto an external drive and then clone from the external drive onto the new Mac, j j just so that I have an extra backup, you know? Um, because if, if, if something were to go wrong, I've, I feel more comfortable having an extra copy, but I, I can't, I can't, without having tried it, I can't immediately think of a reason that wouldn't work as long as there's enough disk space. I mean, you know, obviously if you're coming from like a, a, a Mac with a two terabyte drive and going on to, you know, a MacBook Air with a 256 megabyte SSD or, some, or sorry, gigabyte SSD, that's going to be a little bit of a problem. But, uh, you know, assuming there are enough disk space, it ought to work. Well, and, and the, the second variation on that was going to be, okay, I take my MacBook Air and I'm installing Catalina on an external hard drive connected to that. Mm -hmm. and, and having a boot for having the, the the MacBook Air booted from the hard drive, do my installation, then just simply unplug the the hard drive and plug it back into the other computer, let it boot from that hard drive, and then clone it to the internal drive. Okay. Yes, ish. So um, here's 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 something I learned through uh, painful personal experience. <laughs> Let's say I've got myself a Mac and I've got myself, you know, external hard drive. Okay. And I want, uh, I want to end up, I want to either do a clean install of Catalina onto my external hard drive, or I want to just upgrade whatever is already on that hard drive to Catalina. All right. So there, there are two possibilities. Um, well, let's, let's, let's take the upgrading case because that's that's the that's the easier one to explain. So I could say, all right, I already got Mojave on my external uh, hard drive, so I'm going to boot my Mac from the external hard drive. Great, now it's running Mojave. The Catalina installer is there. I'm going to run it on the external hard drive, and while the whole system is running from the external hard drive, it's going to upgrade to Catalina. So I tried that, and you know, twelve hours later, the installer was still saying. I have another estimated 15 hours to go on step one. Like, okay, uh, wow. So I, I, I just like, it, because, because um, the combination of mechanical hard drives and APFS and, uh, and Mojave or later is, is not the best um, and it's worse with Catalina. So Catalina, Sorry, I'm like, should I explain this? Should I get into that? There's, there's so many things. So, so like, it, I'm just gonna do a little aside here to say that if you're, if you're making a, a clone of your Mac, which is a good backup strategy, uh, up until now, like in, in Mojave, that clone could be HFS plus, you know, Mac, Mac OS extended uh, format. That's no longer true. With Catalina, your clone has to be APFS. Which is, which is a problem if your clone is on an external hard drive because it's flippin' slow. Oh man, is it slow, it is so slow. Now, these are, these are extra slow hard drives. These are you know two and a half inch, 5,400 RPM hard drives. So they're not even fast as hard drives go. But my point is just that when you are running your Mac off of a, a, a mechanical hard drive, especially an external slow mechanical hard drive, it's just, it's super painful and installing Catalina in that environment is going to take forever. So don't, don't do that. Instead, boot up your Mac, running Mojave, connect your external hard drive to it, run the installer on your Mojave Mac and say, copy onto this volume. Don't, you know, don't upgrade the internal drive, upgrade the external drive. That way, those initial steps of copying stuff over 
And if necessary, reformatting that external drive to use APFS will be like a bajillion times faster. It's still going to take a while because at a certain point, it's got to switch over to the, to the new drive. But the overall process is going to be way, way faster. Or get an, S an external SSD. Well, in fact, yes, my, my editor, Michael Cohen, um, he, he edited this book. And so he's trying to test all these things. And I'm so he's like, I, I give up. I'm buying, <laughs> I'm buying an external SSD. So he, he found a one terabyte uh, SSD on Amazon for like 165 bucks. So he installs Catalina, you know, like he follows my steps, right? He installs Catalina on, a, on this. And he's like, Joe, this external uh, USB C, uh, whatever, USB 3 um, SSD hooked up to my iMac runs, runs my Mac faster than the internal hard drive. So he has an older iMac with an internal hard drive as opposed to an SSD. He's getting better performance from his external SSD as a boot drive, like significantly better performance than on his internal hard drive. So, so yes, you're correct. Uh, the, the, the thing to really do is to, to use uh, an SSD as your backup drive if you can afford it because there's still like way more, I mean, the prices are coming down. They're coming down a lot, but still, you know, $165 for one terabyte SSD. Well, I could probably get, you know, a four terabyte hard drive for that same price. So, you know, if you can afford it, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a good way to go. Yeah. And, and unfortunately now if we don't want to go down too far down the backup road, but we talk about cloning things off to an external hard drive in the, in the event that a problem happens, you can boot from it. Yeah, right. you can, but you know, start it up and go to lunch because it'll right. take long to get, to get up and running. So at, at this stage of the game an an external SSD is, I think it's not required, but it's, it's pretty darn close to it to, to make sure that you can just boot something from a different device and keep on going. Yeah. And, you know, as, as, as internal SSDs get bigger, trying to get external SSDs that either match them or go beyond that. So you have like extra capacity for, you know, version backups and stuff uh, becomes more expensive and more challenging, but that's definitely what I'm looking at in my situation. I've got, I've got two Macs in front of me that each have two terabyte internal SSDs and like, yeah, I've got, I've got bootable duplicates and other kinds of backups on mechanical drives. But as you say, the it's, it's so slow and so painful that I just don't think I can keep that up for very long. Yeah. So there's a lot in the book and this is one of those books that you probably should get and, and not, not the day that you decide to upgrade to Catalina by the book. You know, this is one that you want to look at ahead of time and figure out if you really need to go to Catalina or if you're going, and if you're going to what the potential problems are. That's um, right. I, I, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep you out of trouble. You know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, help, help you make smart decisions and prevent problems. And, uh, and, and what you say is exactly true. Better, you know, forewarned is forearmed. Yeah. And, and we should mention too, this is a, I don't know what the what what term you use, Joe, but this is like a pre-release version of the book because you haven't seen the final version of Catalina. So right, exactly. You, so you've been writing this for betas. Exactly. I I've, I've been writing this based on betas and stuff always changes. Um for all I know, it could be another month before the final version comes out and it is it is a guarantee even if even if nothing changes which I don't believe, um, I will certainly learn more. You know, there are some spots in the book where I say, well, the installer is going to do this and Apple hasn't released any information to tell me what this means or why. So hopefully I'll find out before version 1.1 of the book uh, comes out. So our plan as, as we always do is to, uh, you know, keep watching the changes that happen in the betas. We should have a, like, you know, the, usually basically the last public beta turns into the release version. So we should know a week or so ahead of time that this is going to be the final version. And so I will update the book based on what I believe 
15.0.0 is going to look like so that we can release a free update to version uh, 1.1 of the book same day as Catalina comes out. That's our plan. So let's talk about pricing. Yeah. Um, so uh, the book is uh, about 132 pages. Um, I like the fact that it's about 130 pages and this is the 13th version of this book. So we decided to make it $13. Um, it's, it's $12.99. So um, that's the cover price. Now, if you, if you had any of our previous upgrading books, or in fact, if you had any of Shelley's uh, previous Mac OS books or any of Josh's previous iOS books, you can upgrade to the latest versions of the respective books uh, for half price. So that's only $6.50. Um, and, um, if, even if you never had any of the previous versions of, of any of these, uh, we also have a, a bundle where you can buy all three books together at the same time for 40% off. So, um, we're, we're trying to make them as affordable as we can. And we, we think those are pretty good deals. And, and uh, folks, I would tell you right now, go get the bundle. Uh, I mean, if you can do the upgrade thing, if you've already bought some of the other books, that's fine, but get the bundle because we're talking about a significant change here to the device and the operating system that you live with day in and day out if you're a Mac user. And I think probably just about everybody here is going to be a Mac user. Um, and so Joe, Joe and Shavi and Josh have, have suffered the slings and arrows of testing this stuff out, benefit from their experience. It doesn't cost that much, and it could save you hours, hours of time. No question. Sure. So I think I'm going to I'm going to make it just some of my evening reading, Joe, to get through the upgrading before it happens to see what all you say and what I should be aware of. Awesome, because this is going to be an interesting one. So we'll be seeing more of you, I hear. Yeah, well, you know, I uh, I did a blog post recently just talking about how how many of our books of our other books need uh, compatibility updates to cover whatever has changed in the new iOS, iPadOS, and and Catalina. Uh, there are a lot of them, and in addition to that, um, there are a bunch of other books that need updates for other reasons. And uh, there are a bunch of those. And, you know, we're going to get to as many of these as we possibly can over the next several months. Uh, I, I, we, we could literally, I mean, assuming that we, we, we're all human, you know, and we, we have plans and sometimes stuff happens and there are delays and sometimes things don't exactly work out. But assuming that, that I and the other authors are all able to work at peak efficiency. We could be releasing, on average, almost a book a week for the whole rest of the year. Um, and then, like, I know people are going to say, yeah, but what about this other book? Yeah, 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 I know. There, there are still more books besides those that also need updates. I know. We're going to get <laughs> We can only type so fast, and we're typing as fast as we can. Um, we're working on a couple of new books um, and many, many updates. Um, and, uh, a few of those updates are mine, so I'll be back to talk about them. Um, but now I got to go type. Great. Well, and you know, we'll be covering all of the book releases, um, simply because these are the people that really dig into the programs or the services or whatever the book targets and get you the information you want, want, they're not writing manuals or documenting things they are getting you the information you really need. So, Joe, good luck with everything. Uh, we Thanks. will see you whenever you tell me that we get to see you again, uh, which, which, whichever book gets updated first. We'll, we'll, we'll both find out together. <laughs> I don't know yet. Um, <laughs> I, have, I have a suspicion, but uh, we'll, we will find out when we find out. All right. Sounds good. All good right. to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Again, I can't stress this enough. Go get Joe's book, get Shawi's book, get Josh's book. Make sure you're ready for all the transitions that we're about to go through as we move into the fall and new versions of the OSs. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, 
Consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.